Welcome to Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, the podcast that deals with all things mental health. We talk to professionals, survivors, and loved ones about their sometimes informative, sometimes uplifting, and sometimes tragic stories. I'm your host of the show, Todd Rennebaum, advocate, recovering addict, experienced sufferer of depression and anxiety, and author of the children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Hello and welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. I am your host, Todd Rennebaum. Thank you for listening and thank you for everyone that uh, contacts me with messages or questions or whatever. Uh, I had a really great message sent to me about, I think it was last week's guest, Sarah. She's the one from Dubai and she has bipolar and stuff. Uh, This message says, I found her extremely articulate and wise. Her wisdom comes from having such a unique lived experience combined with the experience of being vulnerable. She will go far as these are transferable skills. I was quite impressed by her messaging. Thumbs up emoji. Thank you so much for that message. I sent that to Sarah and she she really, really appreciated that. So uh, keep keep the messages coming. Uh, You can contact me on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, wherever. So anyway. Hey, uh, at the end of last episode, uh, I told you we, I was going to have a guest this week named Angelica. Turns out we didn't do that interview. She was sick and started a new job, so we're, we've rescheduled. That will be coming soon, I promise you. But this week instead, I am speaking with uh, a friend of mine. We've become friends. All these people have become friends of mine. And we met, actually. She was interviewing me about my children's book I wrote, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Uh, she's also interviewed me about the podcast itself. And so uh, she's just a really great lady. She is a journalist. I, right now she's kind of more of a sports journalist, which is still a journalist, but she's she's doing a lot of sports stuff and she does a lot of play-by-play calls and stuff for different teams and things. Uh, she's really amazing. Her name is Daniela Ponticelli. And I've been so excited. I've been talking with her for quite a while now about doing this episode. It's actually uh, kind of the perspective, well, not kind of, actually is the perspective of a child watching uh, an, a parent go through mental health issues. So it's it's really, really important, really great episode. She's an amazing talker and speaker, and, and she's just really, really great. So usually I kind of give it, before I talk about this week, so I talk about what's coming up next week. Well, here's a neat little thing. Next week, it's also Daniela Ponticelli. Her story is fascinating, so it's actually a two-parter. This week, we're going to learn all about what it was like growing up. And next week, we're going to talk more about where things are and what thing, how things evolved when in more in her older years. So uh, it's a fascinating story, and I appreciate her coming on. Uh, and I appreciate her telling the story and just being so vulnerable and open uh, a lot of people that I've been talking with lately, they've never really talked in a public forum before about some of the stuff. So uh, I have to really give credit to the guests that have never really done this before, never talked on a podcast, never had an article, never talked to any kind of media or any kind of anything, even social media talking about these issues. So um, it's amazing that she was she she did this. So thank you, Daniela. So I'm just going to be quiet now and because I'm so excited for this episode. Uh, so without further ado, I give you Daniela. I'm Daniela Ponticelli, and my story, so to speak, starts when I was a little girl. And when I say little, I would say for sure I became aware that Things were not quite functional. I didn't have the vocabulary for it and all that, but I knew something wasn't quite right when, you know, about five years old, eight years old, start you start to realize that you're having to change your behavior around people in the house, around their moods, around their anger, and everything is very surface level at that time. You're a kid. You just know what what's around you and just to give some context, I should preface this. Uh, I'm a kid in Cape Town, South Africa, and it's the 90s. So you're old. 
<laughs> I'm born in the 1900s. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm old. But it's not that long ago, and yet the way that we now talk about mental health, mental wellness, mental illness is so different. Those words weren't even part of, you know, any discussions I was ever even close to. As a kid, you know, you, you're always hovering on the edges of adult conversations. None of those words ever came up. None of those things ever came up. But symptoms, for example, as I said, anger and uh, outbursts and moods, those types of words you hear time and time again and you start to equate it to, oh, that's just how my father is like. This really has a lot to do with my father. Everyone in my family, to some degree, obviously had secondary uh, effects of just living in a household with untreated mental illness. That's exactly what it is, untreated mental illness. Uh, all of us have a degree of needing to maintain our mental health. That's part of it. But uh, that was growing up, that was the big thing. And it wasn't until coming to Canada, my family and I moved to two th in 2000. My, when I say my family, I mean my mom, my dad, my brother. We moved to Winnipeg in 2000. And that's a huge life change. You know, I, I still give my parents huge kudos and, and I'm so much gratitude and to think you had paid off your house in South Africa. You had a nice little life set up there, but because you wanted to have more opportunities for myself, for my brother and really for themselves, too. Things weren't that great in a country that the economy wasn't doing well. And there was a lot of violence. There still is a lot of violence to make the decision when given the opportunity to come to Canada, which my mom was as a radiation therapist, she was recruited. There was a worldwide shortage where we heard of a healthcare shortage before all the time. So in this case, it was in the 2000s and Winnipeg actually recruited, I want to say something like 10 to 20 radiation therapists and there. And for some of them, it came with family. A lot of them were single people who decided to take like a two year contract. But my mom said, I want to go. I want to bring my family and if we do this, we're staying for the long haul. We want to make sure that we become Canadian citizens and, and build a life there because we're packing up everything. And it was so surreal. We had never moved houses. I was 10 at the time. We'd never moved houses. We'd always lived a block away from my grandpa or my nono, as the Italians say. And we were very close-knit with our family. That didn't mean that we didn't have our issues where I remember so many Christmases, holidays, where there's always a fight. There's always something that happened, always some sort of drama. I want to say fight. I'm talking about mostly verbal fights that led to people being upset and blow ups. And it just felt like, does everyone do this at Christmas? Uh, oh, no, you can't make it through the whole day together. All right. Just Italians. <laughs> just Italians. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. Italians with a lot of passion and fervor but at the same time you just you love that close-knit family even though we had had our difficulties um and now in hindsight i know why we had those difficulties right you have somebody who again untreated mental illness symptoms and signs of which include intense narcissism and things like that well people who are like that don't want to celebrate in holidays and let other people have moments of happiness and joy they want to make it about themselves Going a little bit off track here and, and giving sort of flash highlights, Todd, but uh, <laughs> essentially when we moved to Canada, as a kid, I didn't know if things would be better for, or worse. I never had that sort of frame of con the concept of what would happen. Instead, it was mostly just, how am I going to be okay living in a brand new country? How am I going to like having a winter with snow? How am I going to like adjusting to a new school where we finally get to wear normal clothes and not uniforms and all of these little changes. So as a kid, there's all this other stuff going on that you're not paying attention to. But one thing that was noticeable very quickly is that uh, a cross ocean move, transcontinental move. I don't know if that's the correct word sure. is go is going to trigger a lot of feelings and is going to cause a lot of, harm to the routine and the established way things were. And for my dad, the, those first few years, it was really bad, very rocky, up and down, 
um, what we now know as depressive episodes, what we now know as manic episodes and uh, franticness and, and it going from periods of being engaged to like what me and my brother were doing to just nothing for six seven months as though like you suddenly just dropped off the face of the earth was he working he was so that's the thing my dad moved with my mom and he didn't have work and i understand that's got to be a stressful that that's stressful uh, i've been now in that position with uh, partners in my life where i've been someone who's working and they're not i understand there's a lot of stress with that my dad was very fortunate. He got a job right away in sales. So within two weeks of being here, he got work and good work, not even minimum wage work. This was, he was actually being able to provide quite quickly for us uh, while my mom was also working. So we were very fortunate in that way. We sort of got to hit the ground running. We did live in some university uh, housing at the time, like some subsidized housing in Winnipeg. And then we were able to rent a, a smaller home and then eventually five years later buy a house that's pretty impressive you know you think back to that time and again as a kid i'm just going through the motions and doing my best going to school trying to trying to settle into my new life and personally how was the move for you mentally like your family aside how was it just getting to canada starting new friends and all that stuff yeah, overwhelming for sure overwhelming is, is a big part I think to little 10 year old Daniela, who was unsure what was going to happen. I didn't have the greatest coping skills either. When I came here, I was a kid who easily, Oh, this is so embarrassing. Why am I even I feel embarrassed talking about this? But I would, I would be quick to cry. Like if things didn't go well and by things not going well, I mean, if I didn't do well on a little assignment, if I couldn't grasp something right away, I was very, I just didn't know how to cope with, with things being the way they are. Right. I was, I grew up in a very controlled environment where everything had to be a certain way. And so when things weren't, I had already picked up the, the inability to, to go with the flow. I was a very highly stressed kid. I'll put it that way. And was that from pressure that you're putting on yourself or? Pressure from myself. Pressure from myself, for sure. Um, I, although in hindsight, I don't know what messages I was being given at a young age. There was definitely a, a high sense of perfectionism, um, especially on the Italian side of my family. I have four different backgrounds because I have four different grandparents who all have very rich personal stories and histories but my nono, who my father always wanted a lot of approval from, that that pressure continued on, right, in into the whole family dynamic. And so there was always just so much competition, like even between me and some of my cousins, you know, that led to those fights at Christmas time of, oh, why did you get so and so this gift? Why didn't they like they, like petty stuff? Like I'm talking about petty stuff. So I already had this intense perfectionism state of mind where it either had to be absolutely 100% one way this way or I, I couldn't cope I wouldn't say I cried every day I went to school that's not true I was already in grade four by the time I came to Canada but those early grades were hard I just had a hard time fitting in with other people and realizing it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to fail it's okay to learn you don't have to know absolutely everything. But on the flip side, uh, in South Africa, especially the school I went to, they highly value good behavior and good grades to the point of publicly recognizing it at weekly assemblies. And I think in my in grade two, they used Todd, they used to do these things they call good news letters and bad news letters. All right. What? Hear, hear me out. <laughs> So a good news letter is this little green letter. It's it's like this big. And it would say, this good news letter has been awarded to Daniela Ponticelli because she got 100% on her spelling test. Or she did uh, this really great thing in class. And a bad news letter, which is really hard to get. Good news letters, I will say, were easier to get than bad news letters. So mm, that's good. Okay. You have to be really bad. The worst. Okay. <laughs> 
because it was red. It was a big, angry, like mm, face on the side. And you would get it for if you were a bad kid, exhibited bad behavior. So maybe you were rude to someone. Maybe you wore a, an earring that wasn't the correct size and allowance as per the dress code. Maybe it was very militant. Okay. So I'm not trying to excuse why I was the way I was, but when you consider you've got this family dynamic of you got to be perfect. I later learned that my father, like many men in South Africa, uh, when he was in grade 11, going into grade 12, at the same time that he was given his, okay, by the way, you're going to graduate. He was given his entry papers to go into basic training for military because everyone there had to do, all the men had to do uh, basic training and uh, a set number of years in the military. Don't quote me on how many at the time. So it's such a bizarre dynamic. You're excited to be done school and you're, you know, this is awesome, but you can't really look to the future because your future is, well, we still got a number of years where we have to now go and do basic training and do all this. So a perfectionist family dynamic, a father who then goes into another military style, well, the military (laughs) institution, (laughs) institution, and again, gets all of that reinforced where you have to be perfect. You have to be this way. There's good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. And there's a lot of that dynamic and vocabulary as well, expressed time and time again. And it, in comes these kids into this dynamic where there's a parent who does not know how to function. And now the kids don't know how to function. And everything was always such a high level for both my brother and I. My brother was an amazing <laughs> karate kid. Okay. He did karate from a young age. He became Uh, the youngest boy in South Africa at the time to reach black belt level and perform national competitions before he was 12 years old. But when we talk about high level, like every day at the dojo, you know, like train, 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 train. And then for me, it was whatever she can just, she can just sit on the sides. She's, she's good. She's good at school. She's got her thing that she does. Right. But it was very much is that kind of a, a sexist culture in a way. Like? Oh, very much, very much a sexist dynamic where the boys were. Well, you're, and also the firstborn, the firstborn boy of an Italian family. My brother, by the way, I love him so much. We have a great relationship and he's not like this. Like he's really also done a lot of work on himself. But just at those early stages, it was he also took an immense amount of pressure you know, I had to deal with an immense amount of pressure as well, not only to perform and be this amazing, but if we would have a tussle as kids do kids fight and wrestle. And just because we were brother and sister, doesn't mean we didn't like try to do our WWE moves and like do dumb things. Like I'll never forget. There was one day we were like wrestling and uh, the, the, the laundry hamper was, which was this hard kind of cardboard thing was kind of jutting out and I hit my, I still have a little scar. I hit my lip on it and it split my lip open. And obviously I start crying because I, I'm just, ah, pain, right? And my brother, I the look of fear in his eyes because he knew that like, now I'm going to be disciplined for hurting you, even though we both consented to engage in this stupid, risky play of like wrestling. Like he wasn't making me wrestle. It was just the way it was. But it's, I'm having a whole moment here talking to you about this because (laughs) it really does come down to we were just never allowed to just be to make mistakes to get hurt to be kids everything had to be so perfect i i got a third degree burn on my thumb don't it's the dumbest story ever i grade two (laughs) i wanted to replicate uh an experiment at home from science class that taught us how heat rises off a flame and our teacher wait what yes (laughs) <laughs> heat rises sorry sorry <laughs> <We're learning. laughs> so our teacher used this little little bit of kleenex okay and held it it's very small just held it like a, a distance from a flame and showed how it flickers a little bit the heat rises i thought this was so cool todd because you know i'm just the coolest kid ever and i tried it at home but i didn't hold it high enough and this little tiny bit of kleenex catches fire it falls on my thumb because I'm holding it and burns my the top layer of my skin. 
I hid that from my father for a month. Like I told my mom, but I was so scared because he would be angry with me that I was hurt. He wouldn't care that I literally have a third degree burn on my, on my hand. That's never, it's the scar is still there. The, the fact that I was hurt would matter so less to so much less to him than the fact that I, I did something to hurt myself. And therefore it is my fault. I should have known better. How dare I be a kid in grade two intrigued by science and deciding to replicate a stupid experiment at home. And now you're a pyromaniac. And that's what this episode's about. (laughs) Surprise. (laughs) I know we haven't even gotten to the point of this episode. I I guess telling you weird stories from my childhood. No, no, it's it's all, it's all connected. All this is to say that even to this day, as, as much as I've, I've had a lot of success, especially in the things that I want to do and the things that I've tried and, I still really struggle with that ability to just make mistakes. And I was going to say everyone who's anybody who's high functioning in any capacity knows what that's like, where you're just go, go, go. And you think this is, this is fine, but it's, it's such a tough thing to navigate because everyone is, is excited that you're succeeding and you're having success, but then you don't realize how much of your identity is now wrapped into that. Okay. Todd, you got to put me back on the rails here. I'm getting, I'm getting off the the rails. But uh, so, have you ever burned any buildings down? <laughs> no, I promise you, I have not. <laughs> I've been an upstanding Canadian citizen. Oh. Cheers. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> so you, you weren't that fascinated by the flames then, and now you cheer for Calgary. <laughs> I do actually like. I do actually like the flames. That's funny. I never <gasps> put the. <gasps> You see, it's all connected. (laughs) It's all connected. (laughs) Hello, everyone. Just a quick break here. I hope you're enjoying the episode. Uh, I want to tell you about a really great podcast called A Sober Story Podcast by my friend Emily. She is charming. She is witty. She's clever. And she's just a great host for a podcast. Uh, And not to mention, she was also a guest on this very podcast a few weeks back. As someone who's six years sober himself, I can tell you everybody's got an interesting story about how they got sober and an interesting story about what they were like when they weren't sober. So I am begging you to please listen to A Sober Story Podcast by Emily. Another great podcast is Rainy Days Podcast by my friend Jason, who was also a guest on this podcast a little while back. Uh, Jason speaks with all types of people dealing with mental health issues, professionals, loved ones. It, you know, it's basically a lot like this podcast, only it's done with a, a fancy British sounding guy because he's a fancy British guy. So that's cool. Hey, you should listen to that rainy days podcast. So listen to those, write and review them and find them anywhere. Podcasts are available. Uh, so you you guys moved to Canada. You're living in Winnipeg, <coughs> Winnipeg, hey. and uh, <laughs> uh, you know what? Okay, well, we won't talk sports. We A lot of Americans sports. listen, and they they want to understand the teams I'm talking about. Okay. But um, I used to really hate the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, but you know what? I, I I find myself actually rooting for them sometimes now. It's weird, not when we're playing them, but it's like I I like. Caleros, they're you know it's a good stand-up guy i, I don't know i don't know what I mean. for those who don't know. don't know canadian football league talk that's what we're having discussion here and <laughs> in my in my job now i'm i'm working with the cfl i'm talking about the cfl on a daily basis it's funny i'm not a blue bombers fan i'm very much a saskatchewan rough riders fan but mm-hmm. Winnipeg is where I went to go see my first ever Canadian football league game. Had no clue what was ha- going on. None whatsoever. Just thought it was really cool. <laughs> like, hey, hot dogs and cheering. There was a guy named Milt Stiegel. You know, I, I believe Kahari Jones was in the mix too when I was living there. So that like names that now are still prominent names in the league. And uh, yeah, so it's just amazing to think little Daniela was at it. A couple games and she had no clue what was going on but she had a hot dog and a drink and enjoyed herself and now she's <laughs> talks about it daily <laughs> exactly now it's my whole life it's my whole thing yeah so you're in winnipeg your family moved there you you feel like maybe your dad is becoming 
worse in a way, but different. Like, I don't know, is worse a, the right word to use? Yes. And I guess one thing that I haven't had a chance to just set up here. With my dad, the biggest thing is that he had his swings, which now we know to be uh, borderline personality disorder traits. Um, also, he has uh, post-traumatic stress disorder from his time in the military. And a lot of different things that fall in between that. But all we knew at the time was that he would have periods of being very quiet, very withdrawn, fill in the blanks there, what that was, very quiet, very withdrawn, and then very engaged, hyper-social, n- never sleep, insomnia issues. Uh, and then on top of that, lots of anger. He was very, very angry all the time there was so much shouting in our house there was never just having a conversation of hey i'm 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 upset i feel this way it was very much zero to 100 zero to 60 whatever there's no in between and that flight or fight response was constantly triggered you know there was it was just never for me for me and one of the ways that i dealt with it as, as a little girl is i would just really go into lots of reading. I loved reading. It was my escape. I played with dolls constantly, Barbies mostly, because I could create whole worlds where for eight hours straight, like time would, I was probably the most awesome kid that my parents could have because I never bothered them. I was like, (laughs) I woke up, I had my breakfast and then I was in my room. Avoided them. Exactly. (laughs) And then I just stayed in there. I got my good newsletters every day, (laughs) every week. (laughs) Uh, we will circle back to the good news and bad news letters, but yes, it's just one of those things where I loved to keep myself busy and a very creative, imaginative brain, you know, just always love to play. And I was social, especially with my family, like my cousins and, and all that. We were always very tight. We visited every weekend, the, the cousins that didn't live like just around the block, uh, but we were very, very close family, and I loved that part of it. It was so nice, and we would play outside all the time, and we just had really great moments within our family dynamic, and all of that was gone when we moved to Canada. Oh, okay. I was just going to ask, did you have any family in Canada at all? None. So that's so now suddenly you're cut off from all of your supports. We were fortunate enough, like many South Africans even today, when you come to this beautiful country, there's... There's a whole community of people and they're always, they're so excited to reach out. And with Facebook now, it's even easier. You can just find a, you know, South Africans in Saskatchewan or South Africans in Winnipeg kind of group. They're all doctors. Yeah, a lot of them are. A lot of them are. And we can talk about all the the weird dynamic there of that too. But uh, (laughs) because we weren't, my parents didn't have doctor friends when we were living in South Africa. We're very like, I don't know very salt of the earth type people surrounding us. It was never, you know, like lots of money or anything. It was just, yeah, middle of the road type people and lots of family, lots and lots of family surrounding us. But when we moved here, all of those supports were gone. So now you take this, this turbulent father who clearly has a lot to deal with, has never even put names to what he feels. It's just always, always angry or his, or he's this, or or you did this to make him this way. That was was the constant message. It was very, very clear. Oh, he's feeling this way because you didn't, you know, close the window when you left the living room. (laughs) Because that's totally rational and logical. But you start to, to, I internalized all of that. It was always, it had to be my fault. There had to be a reason why we couldn't mitigate this response why we had to then deal with what was going on, uh, whatever, what, however he was feeling. And there was one day in particular, on the, I don't remember even what season this happened in, but it was within the first two years of us being in Canada that my dad had a big blow up and, you know, he's like packing his bags, like he's going to leave. And I don't really remember all too much of that night. All that I know is that he didn't leave obviously in the end he's he stayed and but it it really started to show some cracks in what was going on i never thought that my parents marriage was great i didn't really know much about their marriage they weren't like the overly lovey kind of people 
we would do a couple family vacations and trips, which were always so stressful that I, I probably blocked out a lot of it. <laughs> because imagine having to be perfect, perfect on a 13 hour car ride, right? As a little kid, you can't, you can't have an outburst. You can't be tired. You can't be moody. You have to be perfect, right? But the driver can be off. Be whatever, whatever he wants. Do whatever he wants. And that was constantly yeah. repeated, constantly repeated, constantly repeated. Um, I do know that within those first two years that I was in Canada, I did have to go to the doctor. I went to the doctor at least three or four times with intense stomach pain. I wonder, I wonder why, right? And the doctors didn't know what was going on. And that, this is what I mean, Todd, when I say things have really changed. Because I do believe if I went to a doctor now, with and exhibited those symptoms and they they could talk to me and, and ask a little bit about what I was feeling, they would probably be able to figure out, oh God, this is totally stress or totally anxiety that's that's manifesting into this into this issue. And it was like intense stomach pain. Anxiety did not come up at all. And there was no discussion that this could possibly be related to just mental stress or or anything like that. I I just had this pain. And so they just kind of waved it off with, okay, well, give her some pills and like just sort of watch, see if it gets any better. And it, I guess it did. It didn't really. It just, I kind of just got used to it. You know, just kind of always having this knot in my stomach and just this pain that was never ending. That would have been grade six. Uh, well, I guess at this point, early 2000s, this was happening. What, when did you graduate high school? I graduated in 2008. Okay. I graduated in 95. Oh, God. I'm old. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and, and you started this off by calling me old. So there you go. <laughs> there we go. But so, so these things were happening. And, you know, I started becoming more and more aware because finally in Canada versus the really strict control back home and really only spending a lot of time with family who I love my family to pieces, but they also enable and sometimes discredit dis discredit your experience i i mean from my i remember vividly aunts my, my father's siblings being that's just how he's always been as though that's the okay response to this scenario where we're being psychologically abused there was so much psychological and emotional abuse so much i can't it, and it was everything. It was it. It would be the intangible things. It would be very uh, real physical things. It would be coming down the stairs, wearing a new shirt and being, oh, that's what you're wearing. Nothing was ever good enough. When I say nothing was ever, I mean nothing was ever good enough. Did you resent him at that time? At the time, I didn't know what to make of him. Like if. We we're talking about going into because in Winnipeg we had junior high years, which was grade seven to grade nine, and then high school is ten to twelve. My junior high years, I started acting. I had some behavioral issues for sure. I was super smart, really good at school. That was never going to change because that was I was proud of that for myself, and I'm really grateful that I never, even in my resentment towards my mentally ill father, who again was untreated, had never even had a discussion about this. Um, I didn't turn against myself. I turned more to myself. I said, you know what? I'm going to make sure I go get my education. I became the first Ponticelli to get a university degree. I did those things for myself because I realized if I really want to get out of this, that's the way to do it. It's not taking drugs. It's not smoking. Oh, now you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but the weird thing is, I'm also just very fortunate that for some reason, I just, I didn't turn to those things. I had access to all of that. Oh my God. Of course I did. All my friends were, I mean, weed was everywhere. Oh, weed, weed was everywhere. But we're talking about, there were, there were kids in my school that were doing like PCP. Some were like doing meth. Some were doing heroin. Like there was, when I say I had access to it, I had access to it. If I really wanted or even felt an inclination to try that it was there so i don't know how i got lucky and i do i do consider it lucky i don't know how i got so lucky that somehow some way i turned instead 
to, I guess now in hindsight, I realized I just turned to things that I always knew is that I, I want to achieve and I want to do things. So I really pushed myself into extracurriculars, like especially in high school. I don't think I was ever home after school um, on Monday to Friday because right after I'd either have a drama club or I'd have dance class or I'd have just something else just to keep me cheerleading practice. Um, I had a wonderful, I'm so fortunate. I had a high school boyfriend whose parents were the, so loving. Like to this day, like without them in my life, I really don't know how I would have gone through those years. Um, yeah. So I was very fortunate. And then I could go there sometimes for a couple hours. And it was, that's all I needed was just to not be in my house. But I'm missing the important years. The important years were the junior high years where we moved again. This was actually when my family, so my family's doing well. Okay. Right. Because I told you we were living in the subsidized housing for a brief period of time. We go rent, rent a home. Thank goodness. I was, it was lovely. I love that place. Little, little bungalow house in Winnipeg in, a, in an older neighborhood. And then, but my dad always wanted, I want the, the a bigger home and one of the newer developments. Right. I mean, we, we know the cookie cutter houses, right? Mm-hmm. This one wasn't quite a cookie cutter because it was one of the older homes in this new development. So it was kind of cool. It had its own little personality. I really did like it. It was beautiful. It was a four level split. And for the first time, my brother and I, we had like our own bathroom. I mean, that wasn't a thing before. We had this really cool downstairs space where we had a pool table. But I don't know if if, if you've ever had nice things around someone who's got BPD, untreated, it's hard to enjoy those nice things because they want you to enjoy it in their way. And my dad's also a, a narcissist, fully, full blown. So if, if you don't do things the way he wants it, un- well, now diagnosed, but at the time, oh, all of this was, oh. okay. all of this we'll was get to that. <laughs> un- undiagnosed at the time. Right. 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 So, so what I'm trying to say is personally, I've, I've grown up and I've been told good, bad, good, bad, achieve, achieve, achieve. That's how you get some form of validation that gets exemplified and shown over and over again by even just the way that we've tracked as a family. And now we get to move into a house. We couldn't be more miserable as a family unit, by the way. I I don't think there was much happiness at all. Everything felt pretty empty, but it was exciting to move. I was a little sad because I would have to change schools. In hindsight, it was the best thing ever because I met my very, very best friend there. So everything works out, but it was a really stressful summer, that summer of like going into grade seven where I didn't know anybody and we moved right at the beginning of summer. So I wasn't in my old neighborhood and my, my dad was the type of guy who like, he didn't want to drive you anywhere, you know, he didn't want to do So if you couldn't hop on a bus and then he would tell you, oh, I don't really want you drive uh, going on a bus, you know, again, always so controlling. You just couldn't try anything new or do anything halfway risky or, or whatever. So controlling over and over again. I, I, I'm sorry to make a new community there. But as I mentioned earlier, I did have some behavioral problems because now I was a preteen, living my preteen life, going through all the things and also just getting sick and tired of dealing with the constant pattern of abuse and the cycle of going through the motions and do you think part of it was now you're at the age you're going to other people's houses and stuff and it's that aren't just cousins and families and stuff you're like oh this is how other people kind of live and yep 100 percent. you finally start to see other examples of what a functioning household is and that's not to say that they don't have their own things going on you know and Partly my best friend, actually, her father went through a lot of similar experiences to, to my dad because um, she also happened to be South African. It was just we both went to the same school uh, and he her dad went through something similar. He expressed his trauma very differently, you know, to the same degree as my dad. But we we kind of understood one another in that way of like, there's just certain things when we say no, we need to get home now. <laughs> we mean we need to get home now because there isn't just a, oh, you're grounded. It's it's a screaming match. It is being scared that 
you might not be able to leave the house for like a whole week and not just like, oh, you're grounded for a week, but like you think you can go somewhere and then all of a sudden it gets snatched away. It's, and you just, again, you just never feel, even though I had straight A's in school, I was doing all this awesome extracurricular stuff. I was winning school awards for like citizenship work and volunteering and it didn't matter, right? As soon as I was home, it didn't matter. I was you're just scared to find out who you're going to wake up to the next day. And it was around that time when uh, my grade seven teacher, Mrs. Barton, shout out to Miss. Oh, I believe it was Miss Barton at the time. Miss Barton. Hey, Miss Barton. Hey, she did something life changing. And I don't think she'll ever realize this. About halfway through. Hmm, about halfway through the school year. She called my parents and said, hey, you know, I've noticed like Danielle is just not smiling as much anymore. Like she's not, she's not as happy as she was like when the school year started. And my dad didn't know how to take that. He was the one who actually picked up the call and took the call. So he screamed at me after he hung up. He screamed at me. Why are you not, why are you unhappy? What's, what's wrong? Who is doing this to you? And at that point, it didn't rectify anything at home necessarily, but it it really made me aware suddenly of, you're right, Miss Barton. I am not as happy as I was at the start of the school year. I am not as hopeful. I kind of dread going to school, even though I like school because it's an escape. But now I just feel like I'm not measuring up anywhere and that I'm not good enough anywhere. And then you have to tie in hormones, puberty, woo, bullying at school. I not mm -hmm. mean it. You were bullying people? Both ways, right? Uh, right? Yeah. Getting bullied, being a bully for sure. For sure. And I'm not proud of that. But come on, the dynamics were not great. The dynamics were not great. And when I say bullying other people, I mean sometimes not not excluding or not including people. I think that was the worst part of, of my bullying was that, oh, well, we're going to oh, so go to this thing. aggressive. It's awful. Oh. It's awful. I'm laying it all bare here because I'm not perfect. I mean, no one is. But at the time, right, I I just I just thought I was doing what I the right thing and, and trying to navigate a whole new social world with the school that I was going to, where I was also going to a school where everyone was more affluent than I was as well so i was never like oh i'm i'm sad that i'm not as well off or that my my parents don't have as much as these other parents at least are giving their kids in terms of physical things it never bothered me that way but i did feel that there was a, a, a social dynamic there right oh well we go to our cabins in the summer oh my gosh oh you should come over it's the, the hot tub or like you should do this oh you don't have a hot tub oh my gosh hot tubs are great well it's not up to me whether i have a hot tub or not <laughs> it's up to my parents and their bank accounts and whether they want to do that right so you just there's and a if whole... i did have a hot tub i wouldn't want to go in it because i'm getting shit for not doing it right <laughs> exactly just like the pool table that we never ended up really using by the way <laughs> because it had to stay precise and the worst part about that is my brother actually with his very first job he he was the one who bought the pool table it was his and he he couldn't use it because it wouldn't be used right or in this correct way so we would only be able to really use it freely without feeling stressed when my dad was away and we could just play with our friends but yeah yeah anyway so where i'm going with this is I had a good life. I had a good life. Lots of, there's no, no complaining in that. I'm not trying to say that, but it's just, it's dynamics. It's weird dynamics where as well, my parents or my dad anyway, was the type of person who he just, everything was in his control around this time too, because I was now a teenager. Full hormones. Yeah. And like not biting my tongue as much as I used to just like, swallowing all the words over and over again we would have dinners and this was very troubling but we would have dinners where i would sit down or we would all sit down we would actually still have family dinners which is now in hindsight of like, wow we actually still did that which for better or for worse we did that 
not in front of the TV, like in the kitchen together. But if he was having a bad day, he would sit down and go, Daniela, I do not want to hear anything you have to say today. Or if he would say something and I would go, well, I mean, blah, blah, blah. He would just say, shut up. I don't want to hear from you. And this, again, reinforced a, an inability to communicate about anything, whether it was good, bad, mundane and neutral, whatever. You just could not communicate. It was always red light, green light, and up to him, not up to anybody else. And so at this point, I really, really just began to to turn away from anything to do with my dad. I didn't really engage with him. It it kind of helped. There were times, and I say truly, it kind of helped when he was depressed because he would go six months. Remember, we lived in a four level split, so like one level was a den, and he would just have it shrouded in darkness, and would stay up until like three, four in the morning with the TV blaring, so no one could sleep in the house. There's so much noise, always, and to this day, by the way, I have very um, audio sensitive, uh, where certain sounds and frequencies i'm like oh it's like it's loud you know i just i don't know if it has to do with that but also constantly like you would go knock on the door can you please turn that down it's his it's his life it's his house it's his it's his world you're just you're just in it could you talk to your mom about how you were feeling about your dad i just realized that i haven't even brought my mom into all of this yes i mean the only saving grace was that my mom and i could talk about things However, being that we were now in the space that we were in, where even though we had a good South African community, she was getting horrible advice from people, horrible mm. advice from people. The one time she she even dared share some of the frustrations that she was going through with, with some women in the group. I'll never forget this one woman who looked at her like dead serious. Well, he's not hitting you, is he? So, yeah. So it's only abuse. It's only abuse if you're getting hit. That was the bar. Uh, Physical abuse, uh, everything else, just put up with it. Suck it up. Mm. And plus, we were raised Catholic, very Catholic. I'm I'm Italian, Portuguese, Polish, and Irish. So all four corners <laughs> of the, you know, the 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 grandparents. Uh, yeah. So it, it, all of this again, the context matters, right? Context matters. We, we, we don't have family support. Even family support was hard to come by because they wouldn't understand. They would always try to deflect and say, this is just how it's always been. And it just get, went on and on this way. When I was 12 years old, though, I reached a breaking point. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was another just getting screamed at because I didn't wake up at 6 a.m. to pick up the phone when my dad was right beside it. But I would have to wake. Remember the, the, the landline phones? Yeah. Oh, no, you have to wake up. You have to wake up as a teenager and in the middle of summer when it's your time off and make sure you answer that phone because I'm not going to do it. How dare you? You're so selfish, Daniela. I'm very selfish. I'm very selfish. In fact, that day, that day, I fully, uh, I'll, I, I don't forget that day because that was, he threatened physical violence against me. He never hit me, but he threatened really nasty physical violence against me that day because I didn't answer the phone. And I reached that point where I just said, this is not, a, I don't understand, mom, what world you're living in. Like, I don't know. I, to this day, I don't know how my mom did it. Like, taking care of two kids. She was a single mom. I don't care that there was another body in, in the room. She was a single mom. She did it all herself. Everything. Grocery shopping, budgeting, uh, going to work full time, and then some. Working overtime a lot in the hospital. She did it all. And still somehow waking up every day and doing it. But she was developing bad habits, right? The defense mechanisms, coping, just because she, this is what we do. It's what we do for the kids, for the kids, for the kids, for the kids, for the kids. I'm last. I'm last. I'm last as a mom. Did you ever wish they got a divorce? Like when you were in high school, you were like, oh, God. When I was I 12. When I was 12, I ah. went to my mom and said, if you need to divorce dad, I understand. I said that to her because I was that frustrated and tired of it. Because I, I knew, where am I going to go? I'm 12 years old. I'm not going to be able to go anywhere. I need to live somewhere. And so at that point, one thing did happen. My mom and I started looking into different books about mental illness. We didn't 
call it mental illness at the time. We didn't really know what to give it to, but she found a book called Walking on Eggshells. And it's actually about bipolar more so, which was fine because again, all the symptoms are so overlapping, right? It's, it's hard to say one thing or another or another is this or that. Uh, it's not an exact science. Exact, well, especially yeah. at that time, right? Yeah. Especially at yeah. that time. People weren't even talking about this stuff. So I, I read that book and I remember, as I said, I'm a very avid reader, but I gobbled it up and like, I just started reading, I think at like eight o'clock at night, read it through the evening and just scribbled notes like, this is, oh my gosh, this is, this is, this is, this is what I'm feeling, this, this, this. For the first time I felt seen, I felt heard, I felt like, okay, so this is something that is real, that is not imagine that is not just his personality that is not just whatever we can actually make a plan mom <laughs> we can make you and i and and my brother and like we can make a plan and try to get through this and try to find a way through this if you're not going to divorce him we've got to come up with some sort of strategy here because this is not going to work and so that book was incredibly helpful because it gave me a name just something it gave me something tangible to feel oh my god I'm not, I'm not alone and when i went into high school i want to say at that time there were there was a little bit of an opening to have some discussions around hey if you're not feeling so great it's not always just your physical health that's kind of the way the the inroads that they were having the discussions that they were having still didn't really hear the word mental health mental illness or anything like that at the time and this would have been approaching, I would say this like 2005, 2006 ish kind of time. But, and I remember having finally having some more open conversations with, you know, as I mentioned, my high school boyfriend who was fantastic, his parents were great. I would have conversations with them, which was, oh my God, that was amazing. Because they're adults, they're adults. I can finally ask another adult, hey, so you have life experience, you're married. Is this just what all married people do? Is this like, is this sort of dysfunction just what everyone goes through? Then you finally get a sense of well, everyone's a little different. And you have to remember that just kind of have those conversations. I did have a conversation with one of my good friends in high school about it. And they still didn't understand. Oh, well, my dad yells as well. My dad yells as well. And I went, <laughs> yeah, but is it just like, is it constant? And is it? Is it terrifying? Is it all the time? Is it constant gaslighting? Is it like, oh, just the horrible things? Like as much as I, I mean, to this day, I need to go write a thank you note to that high school boyfriend of mine because he was amazing. So patient and wonderful. And he would come over. There's one time he came over and he was the target of my dad that day. Like, why are you always here? Oh my God. He's not always here. He's here like once a week. I'm always there. <laughs> I'm always there because I don't <laughs> want to be here. But, uh, you know, and it's just like, it's just so awful. This like. Do you dump him or he dump you? We had a nice little breakup. It was, it really was amicable. It wasn't a dumping. Okay. So you dumped him then. Thanks for bringing up that heartache. <laughs> Thanks for bringing up that heartache. But uh, yeah, we, we weren't, we weren't together in grade 12. And in grade 12, I did have a lot of friends which was lovely i had a lot of male and female friends it was one day two of my guy friends came to pick me up because we were meeting our whole group at the movies and my dad came out and did the whole well you're taking my my daughter out and i just i wanted to vomit because i'm like first of all like andrew's gay and secondly no that's not what this is we're friends like we can have healthy relationships and not be and not like, what? <laughs> what are you doing? Dad, you haven't talked to me in like three years. You know nothing <laughs> about me. What do you care? <laughs> so insane. I just, I don't want to use that word flippantly, but it really felt like you were just in a circus all the time. And my mom, I love her so much and she was so great, but I was also now becoming a little bit of her therapist. Are you on the edge of your seat? Because I was talking with her. We actually talked for two and a half hours. So I added out quite a bit, but uh, I, yeah, I, I just sat back and was fascinated by her story. And you, you, you don't want to miss next week. You're, you're going to listen to, you know, how things 
all ended up. So, yeah. And hey, oh, hey, oh, quick, hey, shh, 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 hey, why don't you quickly rate and review this podcast? If you're listening on Apple, it's easy to do. I think Spotify does it. I don't know what else does it, but just rate and review. If nothing else, rate and follow me on Instagram, Bunny Hugs Podcast, TikTok, Bunny Hugs Podcast, Bunny Hugs and Mental Health on Twitter, and on Facebook, Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. All right. I hope you're excited for next week's episode because it's juicy. All right. See you next week. Bye-bye.